Greetings, my friends, and welcome to our look at classical Greece, uh, looking into uh, the Persian, Peloponnesian Wars, uh, the height of Athens, uh, what we want to uh, look at and use for our uh, uh, video look into the documentary, uh, and uh, sort of bringing our look at the Greek city-states to a close as we move into Rome coming up in our next uh, look at a classical culture. So first thing, guys, what we want to do is we want to sort of reset the map and look at where we're at. All right, and that's what we're looking at here. Okay, you can see the major battles, the Persian Wars are illuminated with these sort of explosions and things like that. Um, but our story starts, okay, uh, and it's very helpful also uh, to uh, sort of couple this look uh, this narrated look at the PowerPoint notes with the documentary that is also linked uh, for you guys on Canvas. Uh, we're looking at uh, Greece Engineering and Empire, which is a, a fantastic uh, documentary done a few years back by the History Channel. And uh, what it talks about is out here to the east of the Greek city-states, all right. This area, okay, today is known as modern Turkey. This is this is the Anatolian Peninsula. All right. So this is where Turkey is today. Uh, the city of Constantinople is up here uh, on uh, that uh, isthmus, that that land mass that goes uh, between what is sometimes generally seen as Europe and the Middle East. In this time period. All right, in the uh, fifth century, the beginning of the fifth century of uh, B, uh, BCE, before the Common Era, Persia had really extended its hold over much of the Middle East. And it had begun to encroach on what it felt, uh, or what the Greeks felt was traditional Greek land, which is sort of anything encompassing the Aegean Sea. And as Persia began to extend its hold over this eastern coast of the Aegean Sea, one area that felt particularly uh, uncomfortable with the encroachment of the Persians was this area known as Ionia. And so what starts to happen, guys, you know, in the 490s and then the 480s is these Ionian colonies, they begin to send uh, help signals. They begin to send, you know, word back uh, to Athens, to Sparta, to the other big Greek city-states saying, help us, help us throw off this incursion by the Persians. Yeah, that rhymes. Persian incursion. <laughs> I'm a poet and didn't know it. <laughs> As, as uh, man, I crack myself up. As the uh, as the Persians begin to uh, put Ionia underneath their empire, the Ionians begin to revolt. Uh, this, of course, upsets the per the uh, Persians greatly. Uh, their leaders uh, at the beginning of the Persian Wars uh, was a leader known as Cyrus the Great, uh, and then Cyrus the Great's um, uh, successor was Xerxes, uh, to whom all that. Um, you know, all those uh, images and craziness of the movie 300 uh, sort of takes a lot of uh, literary license depicting uh, things that, that, that you know, uh, with, with a little bit too much uh, license, um, if you've seen those movies. But uh, the point, guys, is, is that Persia feels that this Ionian revolt, the revolt of this place that they feel they've dominated, uh, calls for an outright invasion of those who had helped the Ionians to revolt. And that specifically meant the Athenians. Uh, it also meant, to, to a lesser degree, the Spartans. But it specifically meant they're going to teach the rest of the Greek city-states a lesson. Now, the issue, guys, that you're going to pick up here uh, as you watch the video and the documentary, and we put these things together and we use both of these um, uh, things, our PowerPoint notes in the video, and we make a complete picture uh, of the Greek situation. The Persians were not uh, good on the water. They were not good uh, naval fighters. They did not have a good navy. They didn't really have a functioning navy at all. 
uh, as one of the historians will talk about uh, in the documentary, the, the, the Persians, in fact, uh, thought that salt water, seawater, had demonic features to it. They did not um, uh, want any part of, of naval fighting. And so the Greeks realized this, that on land, they're not a match for the Persians, but the Greeks can figure out a way to defeat them at sea. Uh, and that brings us to our look at what's going to be the Persian Wars uh, in general. There were a series of wars, guys, take a look at the dates, 499 to 479, that's a long time period. When you're thinking of modern wars, you know, let's just start with the American Civil War. You, you know, that's 1861 to 1865, four years. If you're looking at World War I, you know, you're looking at, you know, 1914 and 1918, four years. Um, World War II, you know, you're looking at 1941 to 1945, four years again, okay? These wars in the ancient world are different types of wars, okay? Um, they don't fight constantly as we understood and we understand with modern wars where the battles are going on uh, at any time throughout the year. In ancient civilizations and in classic civilizations, in this case as well with the Greeks and the Persians, it was uh, a series of wars at certain times of the year, um, sort of each uh, in its own little mini uh, war in and of itself. It took place over the course of 20 years. So it wasn't this, um, it wasn't anything like we understand as a modern uh, total war situation where you're at war constantly for years. Um, in this case, there were years where there were no battles between the Greeks and the Persians. And then there were years where there were many battles. So uh, looking at it, if you're looking at 499 to 479, you're like, man, they fought for 20 years, like constantly? No, they didn't fight for 20 years constantly. They fought in fits and starts and in explosive uh, times of the year. Uh, and then for the majority of the rest of that, uh, of that year, there would be nothing going on or an uneasy tension, kind of a cold war, all right? So this is where I want you to sort of focus and look at your reading on pages 194 through 203, and it starts with 5.9.5, getting into looking at uh, and highlighting some of the major terms, some of the major figures. Make sure you get those in your notes uh, as we approach and uh, get into our next quiz. Um, it's here where I would like you to um, sort of begin to blend uh, these two aspects of our notes. Take a pause here uh, and then go and watch the first 11 minutes of Greece Engineering and Empire, where you're going to start to get a real look at the Persian Wars um, with uh, some great videos and some much uh, needed pictures and things that can sort of complete this uh, look at the Greeks. They're going to talk about uh, the Athenian general Themistocles, how important he was to the entire uh, Persian War situation, and how Athens, at the end of the Persian Wars, Athens really is um, a superpower of the Greek city-states. So if you would, take a chance now, pause it, uh, watch those first 11 minutes, and come back, uh, and I'll talk to you uh, about uh, what we want to talk about towards the end of the documentary. Good stuff. All right, hopefully you, uh, you watch those first 11 minutes and now we wanna talk about what we wanna look at towards the end of the documentary. So you're gonna skip about uh, 16 minutes or so of uh, the video where they, and if you watch it, if you want, that's fine. Uh, but it's not gonna be stuff that we're gonna look at as far as notes or quizzable material. They talk more about uh, you know early parts of Greek history and then it'd be awesome if you wanted to watch it, uh, but it's really not necessary. Um, the end part of the documentary, beginning around the, or not beginning around, beginning at the 2707 mark, uh, is where you want to skip to next. And this is where we start seeing uh, Athens as the superpower, which begins to uh, hurt uh, um, and encroach upon the uh, economics, uh, the politics, the feelings, quite frankly, uh, and the cultures of the rest of the Greek city-states, most notably Sparta. Sparta will feel uh, Athens is getting uh, far too big for its britches uh, and uh, far too powerful 
uh, for the rest of the, of the uh, Greek city-states. Sparta always felt that um, it was the champion of independence and liberty. Uh, we know all about the Spartans now from what we've looked at with our course. And Spartans always felt like they sort of spoke for the everyman, the other Greeks outside of Athens, the other Greeks who were like, hey, Athens, uh, you're getting too big, you're getting too powerful, and we don't like it. Um, so that's what the ending part of the documentary talks about, where it begins to show you uh, the Athenians and in the aftermath of the Persian Wars, how they create this kind of little mini United Nations type situation with the rest of the Greek city-states around the Aegean, and they call it the, D the Delian League because it was housed originally, uh, the league, the uh, conglomeration of Greek city-states was housed on this island called Delos, which is out uh, in the Aegean Sea. Go look it up on the map um, from the beginning of the notes or from uh, your downloadable notes that I've put on Canvas. Um, Sparta, right from the start, felt that Athens, and they sort of knew that Athens was going to eventually use this um, league, which was, which was a league, at, at the start of it, it was a league for the mutual defense of all the Greek city-states, and sort of Athens was sort of put in charge and felt that it was at the head of the Delian League, and Sparta sort of could smell a rat right from the start, and they say, no, nah, we're, not, we're not joining this Delian League, we're going home, peace out, uh, we're going to go and sort of isolate ourselves and sort of forget that these uh, wars ever happened and hopefully you'll leave us alone. Um, but in the backs of their head, they knew that that wasn't going to happen. Um, over time, right, uh, what you're going to see from the documentary is that the Delian League, which is a system of mutual defense that everybody contributes money or ships or manpower to over the course of the coming, uh, you know, uh, end of the fifth century, the rest of the 400s, um, Athens will begin to, as the leader of the Delian League, use the funding, use the manpower, use the stuff that they get from the Delian League to enrich itself, to enrich its own city, uh, to build magnificent, gigantic, monumental architectural uh, projects, as you can see here at the bottom right of our screen, the Parthenon, uh, which is built right at the, you know, the, the, the pinnacle of the Acropolis, the high point of the Athenian city-state, and they use these buildings and, and uh, they use money to you know, beautify the city, uh, to repair its roads, to uh, you know, spur on other building projects. And it really upsets and begins to upset a lot of the Greek uh, city-states, not just Sparta, where people begin to say, hey, Athens, um, we're contributing money to this Delian League for our mutual defense, not to beautify your city or to build uh, giant, uh, you know, statues of gold to Athena to put inside your Parthenon. Um, what are you doing with our tax money, essentially, is what, is what they're saying. Um, we want defense. We don't want you to use our taxes to build uh, temples. And so this is the start of what's known as the Peloponnesian Wars. So if you would, guys, um, if you want to now, you can watch uh, from uh, the 2707 mark to the end, uh, where they uh, begin to talk about some of the people we're going to look at at uh, this next slide here. It's the Peloponnesian Wars. It is, quite frankly, uh, one of the saddest aspects that brings to a close the power of classical Greek society. A uh, great historian named Victor Davis Hanson uh, writes a great book, uh, you know, called, uh, you know, War Unlike Any Other. And it's about just how this civil war was really uncivil between Sparta and Athens, between these Greeks, where people began to choose sides. Are you on the side of the Athenians? Are you on the side of the Spartans? And they both really declare themselves. The Athenians declare themselves the champions of liberty. You don't want to live under Sparta's rule. You don't want to live in a society. We all know about the Spartans now, don't we? You don't want to, the Athenians would say, join our side. Why would you want to live underneath the Spartans? You can't be an individual. There is no individuality. There's no family life. There's no 
There's, there's no nothing in Sparta except being a soldier and sacrificing yourself to the state. The Spartans, on the other hand, are declaring themselves the champions of liberty, saying to their Greek allies and city-states, Athens is getting too big. Join us to defeat Athens and make sure that we all can live however we want in our own little independent, isolated Greek city-states. Join our side, says Sparta, to defeat the empire known as Athens, okay? Uh, and so each side uh, declares war on one another, as you can see from the dates, beginning in 431, and the wars will go on for 27 years. Again, not constant fighting. Uh, it, this is where you sort of can start to make a little bit more sense if you uh, have read your Bible, if you read your, uh, you know, any of your scriptures. And they talk about that one uh, in a fantastic part of the Bible where it says there's a time for, uh, and it's, it's also a song by the birds out of the 1960s, you know, a, a time for war, there's a time for harvest, there's a time for peace, there's a time for this, and there's a time for that. And that makes more sense now, hopefully, guys, that in the ancient and classical world, there was a time for war, okay? And, and that time for war usually was what we would consider the summer months, where during the summer months, you didn't have to worry about necessarily harvesting or planting that had gone on or that would go on in the spring and in the fall. In the winter, when it was cold and wet and grimy and ugh, outside in Greece, um, you're not going to want to fight a war during that time period. Nobody is. So basically, guys, you had seasons. You had a season for war. You had a season for harvest. You had a season for planting uh, and those types of things. And that's how the fighting went on for 27 years. And the fighting was fierce and it was ugly. Um, you'll see that from the documentary. Um, you'll see it with all the sources that are left to us throughout uh, uh, Greek history. Uh, and from the people who wrote about uh, the war then and from what has been uncovered by archaeologists and historians uh, from the modern era. Siege warfare was the major tactic used. And what siege warfare is essentially is the armies would attack a city. The Spartans would attack Athens. The walls would be hugely and, 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 and massively defended. You wouldn't be able to breach or break in through the walls, so you would simply just camp outside. You would cut off the supply lines to a city. You would literally just sit there and choke the city out, okay, um, until the city would then uh, not be able to replenish itself of fresh water, get its sewage and other, you know, human debris and garbage out of the city. Uh, and we all know what this brings. You get populations enclosed in spaces. I mean, you know, we, we talk about all this in the modern world, you know, six feet of distance and all that stuff, you know, to stop the spread of disease. And in this case, um, disease in the classical and ancient world, disease was commonly called plague. Okay, and it, it was a bunch of different types of plague. Sometimes it was, you know, really terrifying and terrible, the bubonic uh, type of plagues. Other times it was lesser, um, less deadly type of plague that would affect people. These were, again, viruses. These were bacteria. These were all types of things that would happen when you um, had people living in confined spaces uh, without the ability to get fresh water, without the ability to clean out uh, the uh, garbage and debris uh, that comes from living together. And so what would happen is a city would 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 fall and then you know re, uh, relinquish its control to whomever was camping outside of it after they were sieged for a period and that's essentially how the war went on there were very few real kind of battles as you can imagine uh and it makes sense if you think about it who the hell would want to fight the spartans on a battlefield nobody all right and even the athenians knew that we we're not going to be able to beat them the Spartans are too good. They are too good of soldiers. They are literally doing nothing but making soldiers in Sparta. So why would we want to fight them out there on the battlefield? They're going to kick our butts, okay? So what the cities would do if you were allied with Athens or you were trying to get away from Spartans, you would just hole up in your city, all right? You would sort of, you heard, you heard the Spartans were marching towards you. You would sort of take whatever you could, go inside the city walls and wait them out. 
And, and this is really what the Peloponnesian Wars were about. They were really disgusting, disturbing, uncivil situations. Um, and what happens is with all civil wars at all times throughout human history, there is no winner. Everybody's a loser. Everybody loses the situation. There technically is declared a winner in the Peloponnesian Wars. After 27 years of this type of stuff, Athens finally says enough. We're done. Um, we, uh, we, we simply cannot um, compete uh, with, with this situation anymore. But in reality, all of the Greek city-states um, were left in complete political, economic, and military chaos after 27 years of civil war. It leaves the Greeks open for domination from the north, a place called Macedon. Uh, the Macedonian king that begins encroachment and eventual domination of the Greek city-states is a guy known as Philip II. He's important because, mainly because of his son, okay, and we should all probably know his son, Alexander the Great. You can see him there from one of the more famous images from classical history. And it's Alexander the Great who will, in many ways, respect the Greeks, respect their thinking. Uh, he, of course, will be taught by uh, Aristotle. He, he, he will be um, educated uh, in the Greek manner and in the, in, in the Greek style. Aristotle, of course, being a student of Plato, who is a student of Socrates. And you can pick up on that from your reading uh, and a little bit of what they talk about on uh, the documentary. And it's Alexander the Great, ladies and gents, who, even though he's not technically a Greek, um, he's a Macedonian, he spreads Greek culture far and wide throughout the Mediterranean, much further than the Spartans or the Athenians would ever imagine their culture would spread. Okay, and that's where we come in and look at this map as we bring to a close our look at the notes here. Um, as the Greeks begin to work their way out through the Mediterranean, Greek city-states will begin to pop up all throughout the Mediterranean region. And then even also in where we're headed next, which is out here to the west of Greece, you can see the southern part of Italy. You can see a very important place in Italy called Sicily. Greek city-states will expand and become a major part of what will be a huge influence on early Roman culture the early Romans are going to have a huge aspect of Greek culture uh, sort of mixed into their uh, giant um, multicultural, multi-ethnic, huge empire that we're going to look at uh, coming up with our next journey uh, into the Romans. So that get, uh, brings us uh, to uh, a close with our look at the Greeks. Uh, we can uh, talk about, uh, or hopefully you can bring in, uh, to uh, the course, any of your questions on that material, uh, and we can talk about that uh, as we move forward. But again, I hope you enjoyed our brief look there uh, at the end of our uh, classical Greek notes, uh, and that will bring to a close um, what we're looking at here uh, for uh, that learning module and for the upcoming quiz, okay? Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, until next time, my friends, Professor Egan signing off. Take care.